Hey guys, thank you very much for coming. Very exciting to see so many people here turning out for batch compute. Um, so we're gonna talk about large scale and batch computing on GCE. I'm gonna introduce the cast of characters for the next hour. I'm Michael Basilian, I'm a product manager on GCE. I work on batch scenarios. Um, I also work on our preemptable VM product for those of you that are familiar with it. Um, I make it my day job to worry about uh, what happens on GCE with respect to batch compute, um, how customers are using it, how we can make their lives better, and so on. Uh, in the second half, you'll hear from Bert Holzman. From, uh, he's the assistant division head for scientific computing at Fermi National Laboratory. And he's gonna talk, he's gonna walk you guys through some very exciting work that they did, some really fundamental science uh, on Google Compute Engine, uh, how they did it, what the story is, and including some of the science behind it. So let's go quickly through the agenda. So we're gonna start off with an introduction, which is really just one slide about what batch computing is, just because, almost just because you have to. Um, then we're gonna talk about preemptible VMs, which are near, is a product near and dear to my heart and is very interesting. Um, then we're gonna talk about storage options for batch, right? So obviously, batch computing doesn't happen in a vacuum. You're not just using a CPU, you're actually storing data and you need to put that data somewhere. And when you look at the variety of options we have on GCP, um, there's a lot of them. And so I'm gonna help give you guys a, an initial direction um, in which you can go in when designing your architectures. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about architectures for batch, and obviously we're not gonna talk about um, just general architectures for batch in a vacuum, we're gonna talk about them in the context of GCP. Uh, especially if you're migrating a batch system to uh, GCP, you'll get some idea of what are different tools and how do you put them together to make things happen. Uh, and of course, then everybody's favorite topic, saving money and uh, actually scaling up and making sure that while you're scaling up, uh, the cost doesn't scale proportionally with the size of your compute. Um, and then in the second half, we'll hear from Bert. Uh, and then of course, there'll be uh, time for Q&A at the end. Great, all right, so what is batch computing? Um, I think we're all kind of familiar with what batch computing is, but really the way we define it is for the purpose of this talk, and in general, it's really any kind of computation that's done offline. Uh, this is opposed, as opposed to, let's say, online computation, like a website or an application where there's a user playing with it and they expect immediate responses, right? Batch computing is I have a binary, I have a, some amount of data, I say, hey, computers, take this binary, run it on this data, give me the results, uh, and I'll come back to it later. Um, some interesting examples are, of course, rendering, as in the case of movies or other images, uh, transcoding, uh, either videos or audio or images from one format to another, maybe reshaping it, et cetera. Um, finance and accounting, engineering and scientific simulations, of course, uh, classic data analysis is, of course, just another form of batch. And there's lots of different modalities. There's lots of different ways people do it. Um, there's embarrassingly parallel or maybe high throughput computing is sometimes called. Uh, and there's always tightly coupled high performance computing or MPI. Uh, those are all sort of terms used for it. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about preemptible VMs. Um, so what is a preemptible VM? All right, well, let's start with the good parts. First of all, they're incredibly cheap. They are up to 80% cheaper than a regular GCE virtual machine. Um, they cost around one cent per core hour. Uh, they're very easy to use. In fact, if you guys are familiar with our gcloud tool, it's gcloud compute instances create, then dash dash preemptible, and just hit enter. To create a regular VM, you just remove the dash dash preemptible, and you've got a regular VM. Um, uh, many of our customers are actually using them for real. This isn't so sort of like excess compute that's just sitting on the side and that we're sort of giving away as fire prices. Uh, we have clusters, and you'll hear from Bert, uh, we have clusters that are you know, over 10,000 cores. Uh, but some things to keep in mind. Um, one, same great VMs, same great disk uh, options, same great networking, same images, et cetera. Um, almost every feature that's available for regular VMs are available for preemptibles. But we can and do preempt them. That's why they're called preemptibles. It's right there in the name. You get what you pay for. Uh, we give you, if we do decide to preempt your VM, we'll give you 30 seconds worth of notice and then we will send a shutdown signal. You can use a shutdown script uh, as usual to handle the shutdown event and then back up your data or do what you need, but you get a 30 seconds of notice. Uh, the other caveat is we only give you 24 hours of uptime. If your VM is not preempted in the 24 hours, then we just shut it down for you. Uh, and of course, there's no SLAs or guarantees because when we can take the thing away, what kind of SLAs can we give you? All right, so usually when I tell this to people, they're like, okay, that just sounds crazy, right? Like, you're gonna give me a virtual machine, I'm gonna pay you very, relatively little for it, but you're gonna just take it away whenever, like, what can I possibly do with it? Well, the idea is that you're not doing something with one virtual machine, you probably have a few of them, and you have some workload, and the best place where these are applicable is when you have a workload that has a lot of individual units um, that are independent and small. 
um, relative to the workload, right? So let's take the example of Im uh, media transcoding. Let's say you have a few million images that might be coming from a satellite or being uploaded to some website or something, something, something. And what you want to do is you want to take all these images and you want to transcode them into some other format. Maybe you want to rescale them, maybe you want to grayscale them, whatever it is. What you'll do is you'll put these images in some storage location, and we'll talk about your options for that in a little bit. You will have a master node that is definitely not preemptible. Thank you. Um, you'll use a master node that is a standard VM because you generally don't want your master node going away. Um, I haven't seen any scenario where anybody's used the preemptible master node yet. Um, and then you'll spin up a whole bunch of preemptible machines. You will take images out of that storage location one at a time. You'll assign them to the preemptible machines. Um, and they'll start actually running the code that you uh, have on those machines. And they will actually do the computation for you, the, transco uh, the transcoding of the images. Of course, if one of your machines does get preempted, and they will get preempted, you haven't really lost anything. All you've lost is the work to transcode that one image. All you'll do is your master node will realize, oh, hey, we lost this machine. This image never got transcoded. So I'm just going to queue it back up and assign it to a different preemptible or maybe to another standard machine and so on. Um, so that's a pretty common use case. There's obviously others. There's satellite image analysis. There's rendering, like I mentioned, data analysis, genomics, um, financial analysis. And there's some things you can type into your favorite search engine uh, to get uh, some, some articles and blog posts. Cool. All right, so let's actually talk about data and storage. Um, as you guys know, on GCP, we have a bewildering amount of storage options for you. Uh, in fact, what's actually missing from the slide is the fact that we announced Spanner today. Um, and today, I'm going to talk about two primarily. I'm going to talk about our object storage options and block storage options. Uh, that's persistent disk and Google Cloud storage. Of course, you will still use things like relational databases or NoSQL databases in your batch scenarios. Um, for example, if you're transcoding images again, you might want to say, you know, for this image, the target resolution is X, uh, the target color depth is Y. There's some metadata associated with that image that you want stored and persisted, or perhaps you have different priorities for the jobs, et cetera. Cool. So let's talk about block storage. Um, just to be a little bit clearer, block storage, think of block storage as a regular hard drive attached to your PC, right? Um, and we have three primary options. We have local SSD, persistent disk, and we have two flavors of persistent disk, SSD persistent disk and hard drive persistent disk. Um, let's start on the far left with local SSD. Local SSD is our fastest option. So if you have a batch job that's constantly referencing files uh, or it's working with a specific file over and over and over again or just really needs low latency, you're going to go with local SSD. Um, like the name implies, it's actually physically attached to the VM, to the hardware that your VM is running on. Uh, that's why it's local. Uh, on the flip side, it's ephemeral, which means that once your VM is terminated, uh, your local SSD is, just goes away. Um, it's really good for, like I said, scratch space when, you, when you're actually working with the data locally and you need it, you need it uh, to be hot. Um, scientific workloads, um, especially if you're using something like GPU instances and you just really want to uh, chew through data quickly. Uh, it has great IOPS performance. Um, of course, it is the priciest of the three options. Uh, and you can get up to three terabytes of it. Moving to the middle column, you have persistent disk SSD. Uh, and after that, you have persistent disk hard drive. Unlike local SSD, persistent disks are, like the name implies, persistent. As you can see, we're very clear with our naming. Preemptible VMs are preemptible. Persistent disks are persistent. You get what you pay for. Um, there, you know, you have, if you need a persistent disk that's fast, you'll go with persistent SSD. It's a little bit more pricey than uh, persistent disk hard drive, but you get great IOPS performance. Both of these get you uh, 64, up to 64 terabytes of space. Um, the, everything supports encryptions, and persistent disks also support snapshotting. Um, cool. All right, so those, that's disk and block storage. And then we have, of course, Google Cloud Storage, which offers object storage uh, in the cloud. And we have four uh, offerings that I'm not going to go into great depth on because I don't really, you know, I recommend you guys go to the cloud storage talk if you missed it. I think it was actually earlier. Uh, then I recommend you guys check it out, record it online, or just check out our website. But suffice it to say that we have four options. Code line is the sort of lowest SLA, and the assumption is that you're accessing data on a rare occasion when you need it, so this is like for archival storage. And then we have multi-regional offerings that have very high SLAs, um, and they're geo-redundant, so you can access your data from a number of region, uh, Google Cloud regions around the world. Um, all right, but how is this different than persistent disk? So uh, latency is higher. Uh, on the flip side, you can store a lot of data 
it this star scales to exabytes, whereas persistent disk, as I mentioned before, scales to 64 terabytes. Um, unlike persistent disk, it's available from anywhere in the world. You can use our, the REST interface um, over HTTP just to request the files you need. Persistent disk has to be attached to GCE VM. Obviously, you can expose it from there, but uh, inherently, it's attached to a, a GCE VM. Uh, it's higher latency, like I mentioned. Um, and of course, this isn't block storage, so you can't append to a file, you can't, you can't read specific blocks. Um, you can just insert, overwrite, read entire files at a time. It offers a versioning, and of course, it's cheaper. So what I'm hoping that you guys get out of this is there's a continuum of storage options that you have. And, you know, on the one extreme, you have cold line, uh, and on the other extreme, you have local SSD. And what you probably want to do is you want to pick uh, notches along that continuum and say, hey, for my, perform for my application when I'm actually computing, I need to be perhaps on local SSD or perhaps uh, persistent disk SSD. Um, and then when maybe when I'm not actually using my data or for the data I'm not using or using very rarely, I like put it into cloud storage, maybe I'll put it into, into cold line um, and so on. Cool, let's talk about actual batch architectures. So this is, um, these are sort of samples of what we've seen customers build on, on Google Cloud. Um, this is a very ba basic starter batch architecture, right? Over here, you have our Google Cloud storage buckets. Um, one of them stores the input data. So if, again, if we're going back to the running story through this talk is image transcoding. If you have a bunch of images, you might put your input images into the input bucket. Um, over here, you'll have some analyst or some, maybe it's not a human being, maybe it's a machine that's creating these images and putting them in. Uh, and it's putting them into the input bucket. Uh, you'll have a head node that is definitely not running a preemptible VM, and it's running some software like HD Condor or Slurm or maybe custom scripts that you wrote. Um, and it's spinning up virtual machines to go out and talk to, to read data from the input buckets, do the actual computation, the transcoding or the analysis, whatever it is that you want to do. And then it actually writes the output data to the uh, output bucket. Um, okay, so let's say you've been doing that for a while and things are going well, and then you kind of realize like, all right, well this is, I'm sort of waiting for these files to come down from Google Cloud Storage and it's taking some time. I want something that's a little faster, a little lower latency. Um, what you would probably do in that case is you would take the existing starter batch architecture and you would add to it um, a bunch of persistent disks, right? So you would, have, you would create a parallel file system with some compute nodes and some persistent disks that allow you to um, basically effectively cache the data from Google Cloud Storage on uh, closer to the actual compute instances for the time, for the moment when you're actually doing the computation. Uh, and of course you can use a variety of options like NFS or Veer or Lustre or OrangeFS and so on. Uh, moving on from there, uh, at some point you'll probably realize like, oh wait, my workload is like embarrassingly parallel and if I lose work, you know, if I lose a machine that's perfectly fine, why am I not saving like 80% by using preemptible VMs. And so what you'll probably do is you'll create two pools of workers. One of them will be running preemptible VMs, and another one will be running regular nodes. Uh, it's generally advisable that you guys don't just run 100% preemptibles. It's kind of something that's 80% off, I get it, but um, depending on your business need and how much progress you need to make, you need to kind of make a call about what the split is. I've seen people do it 60-40, 50-50, 40-60, 30-70, and so on. Um, the thing, of course, is that preemptible VMs are preemptible. We can take them away, and sometimes we ever need to take away a lot of them. Um, and so you want to be guaranteed that you don't, your jobs don't crawl to a halt and your progress doesn't crawl to a halt. And so it's a good idea to, depending on your needs, to have some number of, preempt, uh, of standard VMs. All right, and beyond that, you might go out and uh, grow your application even more. So in this example, we're adding auto-scaling and health checks, and I'll talk a little bit about how that works on GCE. Um, and this lets you basically say, hey, if there's nothing going on in my, in, my, in my queue, if there's nothing in there because it's middle of the night or maybe it's a long weekend and all the analysts went home and nobody's submitting anything, just turn off all the machines because why should I be paying for it? Um, health checks basically say, hey, if one of my machines is funky or it's not responding, um, just kill the thing and start it over again. Or if it got preempted, create a new one. Um, of course, we have the file system as before and we're still using Google Cloud Storage for the ultimate backup. Uh, you might have added alerting and monitoring with stack driver. Um, maybe all of this is being computed in output somewhere, and then you actually want to visualize it or like give your analysts an opportunity to do some interactive analysis after the computation. And of course, you might add up a backup node. But um, okay, so let's walk through a concrete example where you're actually um, doing uh, satellite image analysis. 
So you, at the very top, you have your image source. Uh, and what that image source does is it takes images of the Earth or whatever it is and pushes it to the ingest node, which is just a VM, takes the data, does some preliminary analysis on it. Let's say, for example, puts it into uh, cloud storage and then writes some metadata about that image into cloud data store. Um, and it also notifies the head node that, hey, we have something in the queue. Uh, the head node then goes, does some intelligent and brief analysis of the data, puts it in the queue, and tells the compute nodes to go, hey, you can actually go and start working on, uh, on this thing. Um, the compute nodes, of course, can also take into account, we have this Landsat data on Google Cloud Storage, which is free uh, satellite data. Um, they take this data, put it together, and then they actually write the output to do the computation, and they write the output uh, data to Google Cloud Storage. Um, and then your analysts can come back, and then they can actually use things like BigQuery or Cloud Data Lab to analyze um, the results. Um, one thing that I like to tell people when I talk about building batch systems on cloud is if you've ever built one of these things before, you're probably, built, you're probably used to working in this mode, right? You have an on-premise cluster of maybe some thousands of cores. Um, and all your cores are pretty much the same thing, and they are one size fits all because you need, to, you need them for everybody in your organization. And you build a single queue, and everybody in your organization starts using that queue. Maybe they get different priorities, or you have some way of trading off time, et cetera. But generally what happens is that queue gets longer and longer and longer, and people get angrier and angrier and angrier. Um, I've been in that situation. I've been in the that end of that queue. Um, in the cloud, you don't actually have to build that way. First of all, you don't have to buy one size fits all machines. You can actually do that with one of your clusters, but then you might realize that a whole bunch of people in your organization, they actually need GPUs. So in the old world, you'd probably go out and buy some GPU machines. With us, you can probably run them, you can run them by the minute. Um, you might realize that a whole bunch of other people, they need high CPU machines, which are machines that have more CPU, uh, higher CPU to memory ratio. And yet somebody else needs higher mem machines uh, would have high mem machines that have more uh, memory than they do, uh, a higher memory to CPU ratio than a standard machine. And so you can actually do a spin up clusters for each of them um, and give each of them their own queue. So they're not really competing with each other for time, they're competing with themselves, right? And they can choose to make priorities and trade offs as they need. And then you control how much they spend essentially by controlling the size of the cluster. So, in the old world, you used to have queues that would just get infinitely long. In the cloud, you're gonna have lower queue times, uh, which leads to people actually being able to iterate faster. Uh, and that usually, hopefully, has meaningful business results to you guys, aside from just people who are happier and there's less anger, um, you, uh, less infighting. Uh, and then each virtual cluster has nodes that actually fit the workload that that customer, that internal customer of yours actually needs, uh, rather than just buying one size fits all hardware. Uh, which leads to, of course, less, less wasted resources and less costs. Um, and of course, when somebody doesn't need those GPU machines, you can scale them down and just turn the whole thing off. Um, or if somebody doesn't need that high mem 32 cluster, you can just turn off the cluster entirely. And because we build by the minute, this makes perfect sense. There's no reason why you should be paying for machines that are sitting cold. Um, and in the event that you, somebody pushes a change to one of your clusters and breaks the thing because there was a bad configuration or something, uh, that's just their cluster that's broken, not the entire, not everybody in the world together. All right, uh, let's talk about some best practices on cloud. Um, how do you save money? How do you scale? And how do you simplify uh, your life? Uh, let's talk about saving money first. So as I mentioned a couple of times, do use preemptible VMs if you can. It makes sense. They're 80% off. You mix them with your regular VMs, and you make good progress that way. Uh, use custom machine types. Custom machine types is something that I think was actually mentioned by Urs in his uh, talk earlier in the keynote. Essentially, basically, it lets you do what you see up in that uh, upper left corner over there, excuse me, upper right corner, where you can actually select how many cores and how many RAM you want in a single machine, right? You don't have to buy machines as power of two. Powers of two, if you need 14 cores or you need 12 cores, you can actually just set the slider to 14 cores and then set the corresponding memory slider to what you need. Um, and that lets you fit you know, the actual machine to the job, not try to fit the job onto the machine. Um, another cool feature that we have is instance right sizing recommendations, and that's what you see over here. You see those little yellow uh, light bulbs, I guess. That's basically where we sort of look at the machine and go like, hey, this thing is being underutilized. Um, you have a very large machine, but you're using very little actual, uh, you're not using all 14 cores that you selected, so maybe you just turn it down and save some money. Um, so this is just a very brief overview of all your options. 
For those of you who chose to come here, thank you very much. Uh, at this moment right now, there's a parallel session going on. We want to save money, um, saving money on Compute Engine. So please find the recording of it afterwards and check, out, check it out if you want more details on all the various options that we have. Um, all right, now, simplifying your life and making, uh, making you happier. Obviously, Google Compute Engine is infrastructure as a service. We provide raw VMs and, and networking, but we also provide some managed infrastructure services to make your life a little bit easier. So for instance, auto-scaling, you don't actually have to build your own auto-scaler. Um, we allow you to define groups of instances and then apply one of our existing auto-scaler technologies to it so that we actually do the scaling for you based on the rules that you specify. Auto-healing, similar idea. You define what it means for your app to be healthy. We take a look at it and um, and if it's not healthy, we kill it and start it over again based on the uh, instance group. But this, by the way, is actually very useful with preemptible VMs because a machine that's preempted is not healthy. And if you have a managed instance group of preemptible VMs and you say, I want this group to stay at 100 uh, nodes and one of them gets preempted, uh, this thing will automatically detect and just create a new one. Um, and of course, there's also uh, rolling updates and other, and other goodness. Uh, and also going on at the same time is a talk on managed instance groups. So if you guys are interested, please do check out that uh, video. Okay, this is, I believe, my last slide. Scaling on Compute Engine. Uh, this is also sort of in spirit of do not, or as much as you can, try to avoid building this stuff yourself. It gets complicated pretty fast. We have a great uh, solution, which is essentially a tutorial on our website called HD Condor, uh, Scaling on, uh, on Google Cloud with HD Condor, or like, Basically, search for HD Condor on Google Cloud, and you will find a tutorial and a solution that, lets, that teaches you how to use HD Condor, which is a batch management uh, open source application that lets you build um, batch solutions on Google Cloud relatively straightforward, and it may, takes advantage of preemptible VMs as well. All right, that's what I have, and I'm going to turn over to Bert to talk about the goodness of the Fermilab. Thank, Thank you. you, Michael. Okay, everybody can hear me okay? Okay, so I'll talk about how we provisioned uh, 160,000 cores with what we call HEP Cloud. HEP is jargon for high energy physics. And uh, actually, before I even get into physics, uh, I should mention I have to do the legal boilerplate here. So I work for a government lab, so I'm not giving any specific uh, endorsement to Google, even though I'm at a Google conference. I can't endorse cloud products. I can't endorse clothing lines at Nordstrom's. You get the idea. Okay, so... Uh, you know, we're trying to answer, oh, hold on. All right. You're now reading this in Morgan Freeman's voice. We're trying to answer basic questions about the universe. So what's the universe made of? How would it form? And basically, what, what's the past, present, and future of the universe? And, and the high, physics of high energy, phys, the, the field of high energy physics, uh, this is what we're aiming to, to answer. So, you know, everything... Uh, everything on this planet is, you see it, it's actually here in this periodic table. You all had high school chemistry, I hope. Um, and that, you can see the blue line that covers uh, what things are made of out to the atomic level. Um, but atoms are also made of things, and we'll dive down deeper into what those are made of. And so, uh, this periodic table was invented in the, actually the 19th century. Uh, and this is the periodic table for, for the, uh, you know, for the present term. Quarks left. These are things that we're, we're doing. Uh, these are things we're investigating in high energy physics. And actually, ordinary matter, the quarks, the up and down quark there, uh, uh, and the gluon and the electron, that's all your ordinary matter here, too. And in the center is the Higgs boson, which I hope you all heard about a couple years ago. And I'll, I'll come back and discuss that in a bit. Uh, Fermilab. So, uh, what is Fermilab? We are the United States premier lab for studying this field of high energy physics. Uh, it always looks like this, even though we're 40 miles outside of Chicago, right? Uh, and uh, we do completely unclassified research. The site's open to the public. We're the only national lab uh, that does, that I believe, has zero classified research. Uh, there's my office, not the whole building, but somewhere on the ninth floor. Uh, the facility at Firm Lab, what do we have? So we have a decent sized facility uh, on premises. We've got almost 50,000 cores. Uh, we've got uh, a, a tape capacity of 100 petabytes. We've got 35 petabytes of disk. And we have pretty good network connectivity of uh, a multiple of 100 gigabit. So we have a pretty good uh, uh, resources on site. And we're also, I also work for the government, so we know how to 
uh, and I work for science, so we're, we, we do this as cheaply as we can, and, and probably pay people as cheaply as we can, unfortunately. Uh, so I should mention we're also the largest uh, uh, computing facility outside of Geneva, outside of CERN and Geneva uh, for high energy physics. Um, and to do high energy physics, to probe these extremely small scales, you need extremely big machines. Uh, this is a large hadron collider in Geneva, Switzerland. The, uh, uh, <clears throat> the ring is about 17 miles around, and to give you an idea, uh, if it was here, if we, this is centered here, it almost stretches out to the Presidio. And so it's, it's, a, it's a big machine. And I'm going to talk about some of the, uh, one of the experiments. These are underground. There's a couple of interaction points. I'm going to be talking about CMS, so one of the experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, this is CMS. That's not me, but to give you a sense of scale of the experiment, um, you know, these are big. It's a, it's a big ring. It's, uh, we're forming extremely tiny things, and so it's, it's uh, 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 strange, but you need something extremely big to detect that. Um, Okay, so, the, the, and the, also the, the CMS experiment, this is the CMS experiment, it stands for compact muon solenoid. I know compact seems strange in this context, but um, what happens? So we have protons colliding uh, 14 million times per second, and there's essentially a really large camera that takes pictures uh, of, and we keep about, we, we, about a thousand, at about a kilohertz, so a thousand times per second, uh, we keep this data. And all measurements of a proton-proton collision, we call it an event. So it's a little different from an events I heard about earlier uh, when we talk about publishing the cues and so on. Uh, these are events, they have physics content. And this is a very complicated beast, so we need simulations to understand what we're doing. And so we have simulations that go from uh, a stage where we're basically rolling the dice and doing random, uh, uh, simulating events with Monte Carlo simulation through, through simulating the passage of uh, uh, particles through matter and how they radiate and how our detector responds and in the end reconstructing physics quantities. Um, not only is the detector complicated, quantum physics is in our way too. So we can't control our initial conditions precisely and we're only really sampling a part of the space. And so we need to use these probabilistic techniques uh, to sample these spaces. And, uh, and when we analyze this, we compare our simulation and extract physics results. Okay, let me see if I get the movie going here so you can see a... which will distract you while I talk. So here's a plot of the Higgs boson. Uh, well, it's not the Higgs boson yet. What you see is the black dots are data filling in. The blue is a simulation of the standard model. That's, that's everything except the Higgs boson in that new periodic table I showed you. Um, and the red curve corresponds to a new theory. In this case, it's the Higgs boson. Uh, and what you see as it, as it fills in is you can see the Higgs boson start to emerge, not just in our simulation, but you can also see in the data, and the error bars will get smaller as more and more data gets accumulated. So uh, these simulations are critical for particle physics, and we're statistics driven. We need a lot of them. Uh, we need a huge amount of data. Oh, I have to move this back over. Yeah. Okay, so the scale of simulations we need, we're simulating on the order of billions and billions. I sound like Carl Sagan. We're, we're simulating a lot of, simula of collisions per year. Um, these experiments of the Large Hadron Collider needed. And workflows are, uh, I'm going to use a different term than Michael. They're not embarrassingly parallel. They're pleasingly parallel. We have the benefit of having these really weakly coupled things we can run in batch and do it efficiently. So every event that we simulate, uh, every collision can be, can be done separately on its own core in parallel. Uh, and so we need a lot of compute to do this. At Fermilab, not everything is devoted to CMS. Um, there's 70 data centers throughout the world. We've been doing this, we've been doing this uh, uh, compute, computing in this field uh, for, since the dawn of computing, really, and, and driven it for a long time. So we've been doing this particular... Uh, 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 the LHC turned on uh, less than a decade ago. And so we have 70 data centers throughout the world. These are universities. These are national labs. These are international laboratories, CERN, and, and labs all throughout the world. Um, the tail of the tape here, there's about 150,000 cores worldwide available to this experiment. Um, 75 petabytes of spinning disk, 100 petabytes of, of used tape space. Um, and we have strong networks connecting all the sites, not just at Fermilab, so we can transfer data back and forth. We, we, we move about uh, five petabytes back and forth uh, across all the sites uh, uh, every week. And across the Atlantic, we also have 340 gigabits a second. That's one of the things we exercised early on, make sure we get the data from Geneva to Fermilab uh, as quickly as we could. 
That's not enough. That's a lot of compute, but it's not enough, and I'll show you why. Uh, you are here. We're in the middle of run two, where we've got about 158 petabytes of data uh, for the experiment. But uh, we have an upgrade coming in the next five to 10 years where we're going to need estimated of 19, 20 exabytes of data. That's, that's uh, petabytes is big. This is ridiculously huge. So we're going to need a lot of compute to chew through that. We need to do it cheaply because we're, uh, well, we work for the government and we're trying to get every bang for our buck that we can without raising your taxes. Um, the other interesting thing for us as a field is that um, when, you, when I was asked about this five, ten, five years ago about cloud computing, the costs, were, the costs were just too high because, like I said, we buy cheap, we bid, we, we do things on a shoestring, um, but the cost has come down. Here's just a plot of the costs over time, and they're, they're monotonically decreasing to the point where this becomes attractive for us uh, to use commercial cloud. So a challenge, so, so we, we, we got a... Uh, through a, a wonderful coincidence of uh, ex Fermi people working at Google and the right people being in the right pipeline at the wrong time, at the, at the wrong time, at the right time. Um, well, we, we attempted, we, so we asked ourselves, can we double the reach of this experiment's compute? Let's do a live demo because, you know, why not? And we'll do it during supercomputing, uh, which is a conference back in November. Four days, 12 hours a day while the exhibit floor is open. Uh, let's ex and let's do it by expanding Fermilab using something called HepCloud to 160,000 cores. Uh, and let's do it so the application doesn't really notice. So what's HepCloud? Uh, and I didn't name this. This is named by the uh, uh, head of the Office of Science. But the idea is uh, it's basically a portal for our researchers where we decide uh, when we decide where we're going to send uh, uh, their workflows, whether we're going to keep them in-house on-prem, uh, whether we're going to send them to the grid, uh, to Google Cloud, to uh, uh, the other cloud up north that I probably should not mention, uh, to our supercomputing partners. Uh, we have facilities at Argonne Lab, Oak Ridge Lab, at uh, Berkeley, at NERSC. Uh, and so we started a pilot project to explore our capabilities, um, collaborating with, ac with industry and academia. And the goal is to move, well, I was given the guidelines, you should get this into production in fiscal year 18, and so the last day of fiscal year 18, September 30th. So I'm going to get it in by September 30, 2018. So we're in the R&D phase. Uh, and the architecture, I don't have a pointer, so I'm not going to go through this in tremendous detail, but on the left of the, of the dashed line, we have uh, users submitting workflows. Uh, they comes into our facility, and we have a decision engine, and the decision engine decides when we're going to provision based on workflow characteristics, based on the, the pricing, what the preemptibles are, uh, are, going, are going for compared to what it costs us on-prem, what's available in the grid, and so on. And then we either send it on-prem or we have a provisioner that goes out and gets all these different classes of resources, depending on what makes sense. Um, and, and in terms of the implementation, how do we do this? We have a technology that's called Glide WMS. Um, it, we talked about HD Condor a little bit in the last call. We use, it, we use Condor for two things. Uh, we use it to provision resources. We, we go ahead and send in a pilot. We have, and it's a whole completely different talk why pilot-based uh, workflow management is a good idea. Uh, and I don't have time for it here. But essentially, we launch pilots on the workflows. It, it goes ahead and pulls workflows out, uh, jobs out of the queue. Um, and it helps validate environment. It, uh, uh, it manages the fact these resources may look different. And to the user, it can look like a, a common pool. Even at the facility, it'll look like a common pool. And we use Condor to accomplish this. All right, so uh, you know, let's, let's look a little closer at the architecture of what we're doing inside a single zone. So we have a provisioner uh, uh, talking to the Google Cloud APIs. Uh, and then we, uh, we go ahead and, and that launches our worker nodes. We, do, we did everything with preemptible VMs because uh, they're, they're priced right for us. And there's no critical. These are, uh, we have enough fault tolerance built in. If something gets preempted, we just resubmit the job. There's no magic state we have to keep with these things because every collision is independent. Um, we use, and, and I'll, I'll talk about the details of this in a bit. It calls back to our head node for our, for our overlay batch system. Um, it sent data back out to Fermilab to the object store. We read our input data uh, from Google Cloud Storage. And we also had a, uh, we also need to get the application software to, the, uh, uh, to Google in a way that the, the end user doesn't notice. And so we used uh, um, uh, some web caches uh, to provide the application software as well as job by job calibration data, uh, caching later in front of our offsite DB. Um, we didn't just use one zone. We, if we're going to scale that high, it's advisable to do more for preempt. 
Um, so we covered four zones in Central 1. Um, you can see the, the architecture overall, and we were reading everything from a, a regional bucket from our input data uh, displayed in the middle. Okay, so the, the uh, break apart some of the pieces here. So HD Condor, this is a batch system, but also our provisioner. It speaks cloud APIs. It's, it's initially written, it's, it's written by Mad uh, uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison team. Um, it's been around for a long time, um, and this is where Google helped us out. They contributed to this open source project. They added support uh, for this to speak preemptible VMs and service accounts, and actually they fixed a critical bug, which we found the Friday before the, we were going to get the demo on Monday, uh, to address scaling, where we couldn't get beyond, we, we couldn't get anywhere close where we needed to be. Um, how do we provide the software to the application? Um, this is a, 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 a it's, it's not, uh, this, this is maybe a field-specific technology, but essentially uh, we have something called CERN VMFS. It's named after CERN, the laboratory in Switzerland where it was developed. Um, it's basically a, a web CDN to distribute our application software. And the idea being that we have terabytes of software sitting out there on a disk. Uh, on disk, we go ahead and just cache the bits that we need. Um, it's, it's very efficient. We need, and it also a lot, gives us the flexibility instead of sending a single application into the cloud, um, we, have, we can have many, many different versions pr provided uh, to our end users doing this, uh, doing the, uh, uh, prov um, sending the scientific workflows. Uh, and and they, don't, they don't know about any of this. This is completely uh, uh, transparent to the user. Okay, and so we had a managed, inst group, uh, we had a managed instance group doing squid web caching. If there's anything that uh, we know cloud providers are terrific at and Google's terrific at, it's web, right? So it's an internal facing cache using the ILBs, and we set it to auto scale probably conservatively when uh, the rates went above nine megabytes per second. Um, and I give you some more stories as I go on, nothing's perfect. Um, so we had an issue, these are squids, and there's health checks built in um, where they go ahead and they try to get a file out of your web server. Um, that's great for standard web servers. It's awful for squids because squids are proxies. Um, when you do a get on a squid, it's getting not slash blah, 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 but it's getting HTTP and so on. Um, so, and the, uh, and the, the health checks only took something with a leading slash. So, unfortunately, squid has some internal URIs, so that was our solution or our hack to go pull those in. So, if you try to do this, uh, this will help you. Um, we pre-staged our input data to GCS. So, uh, uh, so we have an experiment, we have, a, we've, like I said, we've been doing distributed computing for a long time with a lot of data, so there's a lot of field-specific technology that we use. We have uh, experiment-specific data placement services, uh, which schedules transfers, places data sets, and so on. Um, just this year, the technologies we're using in the, uh, have, uh, speak, are starting to speak the right cloud languages. In particular, they speak, at the moment they speak uh, uh, S3, and so we're able to use the S3 compatibility modes to transfer data in, uh, and we're able to do it at 10 gigabit. And 10 gig the only reason we're limited by 10 gigabit is uh, the our object store. I could not do third-party transfers without upgrading some bits of it, and we needed to get uh, half a petabyte in, and we had a we we had enough time to do it. So I just let it it, it completely redline the NIC at 10 gigabit, and we let it go. Um, and we access these data. Uh, v using uh, GCS Fuse uh, on startups. So we access over Fuse mounts, look like uh, uh, slash whatever, whatever to the, to the uh, application, which was great, and it performed uh, uh, very well. Uh, and uh, along the way, to not just to make sure the input was working, but the output looked like we were gonna need more than 10 gigabit at the scale we're talking about. Um, so, uh, so thanks to Google and also our Energy Sciences Network, the peering was upgraded to 100 gigabit temporarily for the uh, uh, for, our, for our work, and then, uh, ironically, it was actually scheduled to get upgraded a couple months later, so it's 100 gigabit now. Uh, we also converted, we had a regional bucket for cloud storage. Uh, we converted that overnight to save costs. As we, when we realized that we were fine, we had enough capacity in a single region, overnight, half a petabyte was converted, uh, and it cost us 30% less. Okay, so, right, the big question, right? I talked all this, gave you all the architecture. Question is, how do we do? Uh, we did great. So this is the course from Google. This is a plot from our own dashboards. They're running at CERN. And the different colors you see here, everything else, everything that's not purple are different sites. The red is, uh, 
the, the red, which is, uh, let's see, I don't have a pointer, but the red that's, next, that's on top, that's Fermilab. Uh, and everything else, this is everything we run all over the world during this time. And what you see is we doubled the computing capacity for the experiment. 300,000 cores contributing to science, to high-energy physics during this time. And here's a plot from our dashboards. Uh, we're ingesting this uh, uh, into Grafana. And the, and the, the money plot, I, I have other plots at 160,000, but there's one I took a nice screenshot. Uh, the money plot is the one all the way in the middle, the pie chart. The, uh, uh, the yellow is everything that we have all over the world, all these 70 data centers running and, and teraflops uh, per second and teraflops. And the, uh, the green is, is, is what we're getting from, from GCE. So uh, we were able to hit our target. Uh, and uh, I should say we were able to do this in, uh, we got the go ahead to do this three and a half weeks before the conference, before the uh, supercomputing. So, we were able to do it in record time, thanks, thanks also to, thanks to the Fermilab and also a great team at Google. All right, so what are some of the lessons we learned? Uh, you know, Michael talked about the custom machine types. Uh, we started out with a standard machine type. That's more than we needed. We trimmed it down, and it was extremely easy to do so, uh, and that was a 20% cost savings. Uh, I mentioned the code that uh, Google helped us uh, uh, fix. Uh, we had a bug in our, there was a bug in the code. It's been there ever since Condor put in support for GCE, which has probably been three, four, five years. Uh, it ignored the AP pagination API, which, you know, is, it really shows up in funny ways because you get an alphabetized list of VMs that were getting deleted out from under us because our, our state, we had no idea what our state was. Um, Google provided the patch. Um, and then uh, here's a fun one. Uh, as we were expanding capacity in the zone, in the region, we went from 4K to 16K IPs. Uh, there should be a carriage return there, but it's a simple API command, G Cloud, Compute Network, Subnets, Span IP range, and so on. That's great, except uh, maybe you see the problem in that red 20 right there in the uh, firewall. Yeah, 20 is 4K, 20 bits is 4K, so uh, we ran into that. We fixed it, but when you go to scale, these are sorts of things you discover. We would have never discovered this pagination bug if we had kept it 10,000 cores uh, or something small. All right, so you know, here are some of the numbers, the tail of the tape, so to speak. Uh, we ran about six, almost six and a half million hours of wall time on these resources. Uh, we had five and a half for completed jobs. We submitted more than 730,000 of these uh, simulation jobs, and each job is more than one collision. It's a whole host of them. Um, only 47 didn't complete because we have fault tolerance with our batch. We have fault tolerance uh, with uh, the application that feeds the batch. Um, and once we got out of the uh, uh, infant mortality of the first day of the demo when we found um, some of these issues, like that firewall issue was day one, uh, where, we're, uh, hurriedly, where we, we spent a lot of time hacking at laptops to get to the bottom of that, um, the good put, in other words, uh, uh, which is, uh, uh, was at 94%, in other words, 6% of the cycles that we had were wasted and, and results we didn't get back. 94% of our compute came back to us, even though we were using... Uh, exclusively preemptible VMs, so we had a, a terrific result. And that's better than a lot of our grid sites, which are not uh, necessarily dependable. Oh, well, uh, it depends which university and lab you're going to. It's a host of sites, but that's better than a lot of our, our grid computing sites. Uh, it's not, I, I'd be fired if it was better than uh, Fermilab, probably, or, but, so it's, uh, we, we do, well, it depends on what the jobs are doing, too. Um, in terms of the cost, so it, a view of the cost, this is what it costs us during supercomputing. Uh, the main cost was, the, not surprisingly, the cost to compute for the VMs. Uh, it cost us about 8.5K for network egress. You pay for every byte you get out of the network. Um, we, have a, we optimized a workflow so they didn't bite us too much. There are other workflows that will cost more. Uh, the disk that's attached to the VMs that we needed for our workflows. Um, and then the storage, that half a petabyte that we stored, uh, cost about $3,500. Uh, we generate 200 million physics events, okay, 81 terabytes of data for the experiment. Um, and in terms of the cost, and these costs have a lot of caveats built in, so um, it ended up costing us about 1.6 cent per core hour. Um, on premises, our costs are about a little less than a cent per core hour, but that makes a bunch of assumptions. Number one, that we're 100% utilized, and since I work for Fermilab, I won't show any plots demonstrating anything different. Um, it also, keep in mind, I work, as I said, many times I work for the government, and Fermilab being the, uh, this high-energy physics frontier, we have a collider at, at, at Fermilab. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a big deal, uh, and it, 
uh, we get power for cheap because it's a lot, uh, believe me, it may cost you a lot to run power to your data center, but running a proton-proton collider is, 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 is quite a lot of power. So we get a good rate on our power. Um, so we did this for CMS, for this experiment I talked about, the Large Hadron Collider. Um, we had some credits left over. We had some impetus to see what we could do after supercomputing. So how quickly could we onboard a new user, somebody that hasn't done anything with GCE? The CMS was part of this run-up. So there's an experiment called MutaE. I won't go into the physics uh, in any detail, but the basic idea is trying to measure the rare decay of muons to electrons, uh, which has never been observed. And so it would be a complete change to the standard model of particle physics. This, uh, it would be really interesting. The experiment's getting designed now. So it's in the design stage. You're trying to figure out where to put all these bits. And I won't, tell, I won't talk about the technical bits of what these things are, but where do you put the detectors and, and, and optimize them? So that's what we're simulating, different placement, different geometry, how big should things be for this detector. So how quickly do we get them on board? Less than a day. They were ready for, dis now these, this is an experiment that knew how to do grid computing, distributed computing, but we had all the tools in place. They were prepared, and, and it took us less than a day uh, after supercomputing to get them up on GCE. And what you see here is the green is Google Cloud, and the yellow is what we're running for them on-prem at Fermilab. So uh, that's, a, that's a terrific result, I think. Uh, uh, and it, and it's, uh, uh, it shows that uh, you know, the field, our field, actually, having been prepared for distributed computing, uh, uh, understands what they need, understands some of the things they need to do to be able to go bring stuff into the cloud. All right, so what are we doing next? Uh, like I said, we're moving into production in September 2018. We have this decision engine component, which is, I think, really interesting, the heart of it. It's also extremely difficult, and I don't need to get anything optimal in there, but that's an R&D. Um, our super the Department of Energy, uh, and again, this is your tax dollars at work, um, but we have supercomputers, HPC facilities, um, and these are becoming much more friendly for data-intensive workflows. And so uh, we're provisioning cycles already at, uh, at Berkeley, at NERSC, on Edison and Corey, and we're expanding this. Um, there's additional commercial cloud providers. Uh, I talked about Google. We've done uh, uh, something similar with Amazon. Um, next, I mean, there's, uh, you know, everybody next on the, uh, you know, we're, uh, as, you know, I, since I work for the government, I, uh, I have to put things out to bid, and I, I and we're, we spread things as, as, we spread the manure over as many fields as we can get to, right? Um, and then there's non-pleasingly parallel problems. So, uh, you know, deep learning, there are, I, I taught, there's a lot of compute involved with doing the, uh, 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 doing these simulations and doing the data uh, reconstruct, we, reconstruction we do on our data. Uh, but we have other interesting problems that may lend themselves well to deep learning. We have um, uh, thousands of tons of liquid argon detectors where we're look, looking for 3D tracks. And when you start looking at what you need to do with this, it looks an awful lot like uh, image classification and 3D problems. And so the field is actually starting to re-embrace uh, 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 deep learning. There was a, the field embraced neural, when it was called neural networks, the, uh, the field got, got involved, but we didn't have the compute. I think we probably had enough data in the field, but we didn't have the compute uh, to really uh, 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 make a, uh, a, a sea change in, in how we did our analyses and new architectures. All right, so I just wanted to thank, the, this isn't my, just my work, it's a work of cast of many. So we have a great team at Fermilab that did the work, um, the HT Condor and GlideMS projects. Um, open Science Grid, I didn't talk much about this except in the context of grid, but a lot of the stuff that sits underneath, the software packaging, the tooling, the CERN VMFS, the stuff that gets packaged, um, when things uh, uh, land on our worker nodes, they have all the tools we need um, from the Open Science Grid's collaborative project between the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. Um, the Energy Sciences Network, none of this, you can't do any of this without networking, data intensive science. Um, our team at Google, uh, Michael, Curran, Solomon, Sam, Paul, the Pauls, and uh, Doug Strain. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, again, I work for the government. I can't buy stuff directly from Google either. Your terms and conditions are things I can't agree to. So we need to go through resellers uh, that, that take care of that for us. Uh, and I, I can't advertise for uh, uh, commercial products, but I will advertise for the laboratory. So we're, it's our 50th anniversary at Fermilab. If you're anywhere near Chicago, come by this year. There's a website. We've got uh, symposia. We've got a uh, big birthday celebration. We're going to have an enormous open house. If campus is open to the public, please come by, and that's it. Thank you.